Hello, my name is Mike, and this is a bike. Hello, my name is Mike, and this is a bike. Hello, my name is Mike, and this is a bike. Hello, my name is Mike, and this is a bike. This is the project we are currently working on. You've seen episodes one, two, and three. Well, welcome to episode four. We put the finishing touches on it. Uh, we're going to get some tires put on it to make it roadworthy. We're going to uh, put the, a different exhaust on it. We're going to do a lot of cleanup. We're going to go through and make sure all the switches and all that stuff functions. And then we're going to take her for a spin. So come along on the ride with us. Somewhere in a dusty, dirty back alley in western Arizona is an old fart trying to cram a square peg into a round hole. He'll work on anything, just as long as it's got at least two cruel wheels. episode, I mentioned that I had received in the mail the uh, pickup tubes and filters for the fuel tank. So we're going to go ahead and install those in this tank. Now one of the nice things about having them on hand is I can use them as a template to, uh, to put the hoses on the other uh, components that I have so that I'll have a, a spare and I'll be able to match the configuration, the shape and the length and the curvature of the tubes. So that's my goal here is to is to duplicate what I get in the uh, in the package, uh, as well as install it into the tank. So back in the tank we go, just like in the uh, previous episodes where we did this, and then uh, I'll show you how it turned out. It turned out pretty good. I ended up using an old fly swatter, yeah, a fly swatter, to be a form or a uh, holding fixture for one of the hoses, so it maintains the correct shape.
I've encountered a couple of small miracles today. First of all, you guys saw me getting this bike on and off the trailer and so forth, and the brakes work. Sat for eight years, all the other fluids turned to crap, but amazingly, both the front and rear brakes, the fluid's good, the pistons of the masters and the calipers are working. Uh, the brake line doesn't look all that great, but as long as it holds pressure, we'll be fine. So I was very pleased to see that. And the other one, well, it's a victory, and the fork seals are not leaking. Shh! Don't tell the bike. They're kind of dry rotted. I mean, at least the dust seals are kind of dry rotted. Um, but I'm not going to worry about it until they actually start leaking fluid. So, but what we do notice is that the paint has turned to crap on the fork tubes. And that's actually pretty common. Uh, in fact, when I did this bike, uh, I had them uh, powder coated. This one, well, I spray painted them silver. But this one, well, it just so happens I happen to have a can of spray paint. It's damn near a color match for the bike. So this is the paint we'll be using. Uh, it is an epoxy paint. So it should, uh, look, it's even high temperature. So I can overheat my front bearings if I want to. That's lovely. Anyway, so that's what's going to go on it. We'll get them prepped up real good. Uh, we'll get everything uh, kind of masked off around it. And we'll shoot some paint on it while we're mounting our new tire. <clears throat> now, I yanked a couple of tires down off my shelf. I've got a good used tire on it. That's not all dry rotted like the one that's on it. I've got a new tube right there to go in it. And lo and behold, one of the tires on my shelf was actually a brand new one. So the rear is going to get a new one once the tube for the rear arrives. So I only have the one tube now. So we'll get some fresh skins on it. It also gives me an opportunity to do a nice thorough cleaning of this wheel. Um, you know, we hosed it off as best we could at the car wash, but we didn't get all the debris off. So as we do every little bit and piece of this bike, there's going to be a lot of cleaning going on as well. So back at it.
So this falls under the category of shit snowballs. So I started off wanting to change a the tire. Then I decided to paint the forks. Well, in the process of painting the forks, I wanted to take the lower fork tube clamp bolts out just so I don't have to mask them off. And what I found was, well, the original bolts were just standard grade eight steel hex end bolts. At some point in time, somebody took it upon themselves to put, I don't know if these are chrome or stainless, but I know that stainless steel threads are horrible when they go into aluminum. And when they go into aluminum, for some reason they gall up and well, I went to take this one out, I tried to work it out back and forth, used WD-40, used heat, and the son of a gun snapped off with part of it still in the fork tube. So now, instead of just simply painting the fork tubes, I gotta get in there with a drill and try to get that broken off piece out. <laughs>
enough to put it back together, and you'll notice it's a perfect, perfect match. What the? Well, that sure looks like gloss or semi-gloss black to me. Let's see what that can says again. Hmm. Something tells me the wrong cap got put on this can. Oh well, the black forks look a hell of a lot better than the decomposing grayish primerish stuff. that comes up on victories pretty frequently is the display on the instrument panel. When you turn the key on, it'll do its prove out thing and then it'll tell you the odometer. But uh, right now the engine's off so it'll probably cycle the word check engine. Um, but that uh, display there has multiple functions and you have a switch on the back of the hand grip right here that allows you to access several different functions. The problem is that set of contacts, well, it gets corroded very, very easily. Uh, even if the vehicle doesn't sit out in the elements like this one did, just ordinary day-to-day -day, uh, uh, riders have that same problem. So it's pretty simple, really. You take the, uh, the hand control apart, you get up in there with a little bit of abrasive, uh, either like emery cloth or maybe a small nail file or something and clean those contacts off, put it back together. And when you push the button, you should be able to cycle through and get, you should be able to see the odometer, a trip odometer, a clock. Uh, it will show you your fuel tank, how much fuel is in your tank, and also your battery charging level. So it's, uh, it's one of those things you want to have working, especially if you want to keep an eye on how much fuel you've got. It still has a low fuel light, so even if your gauge doesn't work or the push button doesn't work, it will let you know when you're low on gas. So this is the one on the right hand side that allows you to toggle between the different modes and then on the other side there's a button and you can see the word set there that's the one used for setting the clock so this will reset your trip odometer and some other functions uh, you don't once things are set you don't use that one as much as you do the one on the other side to just scroll through the menu now once you get it off this is the back side of that switch. If you remove this screw right here, this Phillips screw, there's a little spring-loaded set of contacts. You can get in there and clean them out manually, and lo and behold, everything will work again. You can do the same on the other side. Okay, the screw is out. Now I can remove this, set this aside for now. So now, taking a good close look at it here, this is that set of contacts. You can see how moisture could get in there. There's a spring and there's a contact on this side and a contact on the other side. So we're just going to get in there with a little bit of uh, emery cloth or something. And I've got here just a small piece of sandpaper. I'm going to go in between the coils of the spring with my sandpaper. If you guys can see that okay. And then by depressing the button well, I've got my sandpaper in there. I'm now squeezing it between those contacts. I'm going to repeat that several times. And that should break the crud surface on those contacts and allow it to do its job once again. One of the things I also like to do is put just a little WD-40 on it to help protect it from future corrosion. Out of things. It's not a permanent stop, but it does help over short periods of time. Let me turn my key on. Get up here where you can see that display. Kind of hard to see in this light. 
31,923. Now I'm going to squeeze those contacts. And now, I can't tell which one that is. That's trip odometer, clock. Uh, it has to do with headlights. I don't remember what it does. Okay, it's got one gallon of gas in it. And the alternator is currently sitting at, well, the battery is sitting at 12 volts. Of course, if it was running, it'd be sitting closer to like 14 volts, but it's not running at the moment. Push it again, it goes back to the regular odometer. So those are the functions. Now that I've confirmed it's working, I'll go ahead and put that all back together. It's also an excellent opportunity to get in there and shoot a little lube into those throttle cables as well.
Well, you might ask why I replaced the tires if they both held air just fine and still had good tread on them. Well, it's because they're old. Tires break down over time because they're made out of rubber and they do actually have a freshness date on them. Uh, most uh, people recommend six years. Don't let your tires get more than six years old. I've run them as long as 10 years. These tires, well, as you can see from this inner tube, they were just about ready to give up the ghost. I feel a lot better now knowing that I have new tires and new tubes. Now, a lot of other YouTubers, if they need some specialized little part or bracket or component, well, they just sit on their computer and they go into their CamCAD program, they create this perfect little part that's designed to fit perfectly, and then they plug it into their, um, their 3D printer or their plasma cutter, and boom, they've got this perfect part that bolts right on, looks awesome, does the job, right? Well, I don't do it that way. I do it the old school way. I get myself a chunk of metal, I get some hammers and drills and saws and stuff, and I cut something up and I bend it and I eyeball it and try to see if it fits and waller it out a little bit and make it work. Now you may ask, well, why do I do it the difficult way like that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm old school. I like creating stuff with my hands. And number two, more importantly, well, I'm a cheapskate and I'm not going to go out and buy the CamCAD software or the plasma cutter, at least not till I can afford it. That's not to say that I might not get one in the future. I'm just not rich enough right now. So for today, I'm going to make this Kawasaki backrest fit my victory. And you might say, well, why did you go through so much trouble to make a Kawasaki part fit your victory? Well, go back to lesson, or point number two. <laughs> I'm a cheapskate. I got this for 20 bucks, and to get the comparable part for a victory was 70 bucks. So it's worth saving 50 bucks for me to play with drills and, you know, smash my fingers and get metal shavings in my eyes because, you know, that's just how I roll. this video a nice little collage of me riding down the road through the beautiful hills and cliffs near us and drone shots and all that wonderful stuff well but the problem is it just doesn't run good enough yeah we got it to look good we got it to run but it's running real real rich so unfortunately we're going to end this episode without it being a hundred percent but then that gives us a topic for the next video and they turn out pretty good appearance wise 
So come on back for the next video. Let me show you the bike a little closer before you leave. Get her in the light. And you can see she cleaned up pretty darn nice. Let me flip this around. So she cleaned up pretty nice. Far cry from the way we got her when we pulled her out of the weeds, out of that guy's yard. And uh, we'll get her running as good as she looks here in the next couple of episodes. So come on back. And if you're a rider, ride safe out there. <laughs>